asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. From tomorrow, we will be one year away from leaving the European Union, allegedly, if you believe that. Now, this is a story that hasn't done the rounds of the media today because they've been talking about Harvey Weinstein and they've been talking about Russia again, of course, and plastic in the ocean. And they've been talking about, of course, the war boys case, the taxi driver rapist, all of this. But here's a story. So tomorrow we should be only one year. There should only be a year from tomorrow before we leave. It's not going to happen. Now, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, and David Davis, the government's Brexit negotiator, you know last week they agreed the terms of a transition period with the European Union. Now, I reported on this and I wrote some very strong things about it. The terms of the transition period, by the way, which will run until New Year's Eve 2020. Don't think or imagine we're leaving the European Union in a year's time. We ain't. The transition period will run until New Year's Eve 2020. I had a bit of a rant about this. In case you don't know what the terms agreed were, this is proper sellout stuff, this. EU citizens who arrive in the UK between March 29th next year and New Year's Eve 2020, well, those people will get the same rights and privileges and guarantees as those who arrived before Brexit. This is a disgrace. The UK will still be party to existing EU trade deals with other countries. Not only will the UK be subject to existing rules and regulations of the EU, but they will also be the, the, the UK must also obey any new rules and regulations in the transition period. And importantly, and I had a good say about this last week, the European Union will continue to dictate fishing quotas. Now, the UK will be consulted on the quotas, according to Michel Barnier, um, as I reported on 10 days or so ago. But the EU will still dictate the quotas. And there was also a horrifying statement on Northern Ireland, which it was said will stay in parts of the single market if there are no other solutions to avoid the hard border. So what that transition period agreement meant to run until New Year's Eve 2020, it meant that we ain't leaving the EU, at least not before 2020 or 2021. Okay? Now, fishing rights is massive. Sky News' Adam Bolton spoke with a guy called Bertie Armstrong, Bertie is the Chief Executive Officer of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. And the naivety, and I'm sure Bertie's a nice fella, but the naivety on display here by Scottish fishermen is a thing to behold. Bertie Armstrong of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, here he is speaking with Sky News' Adam Bolton. It doesn't look, frankly, as if uh, fisheries are going to be given top priority by uh, David Davis and the negotiating team, does it? Well, the, the fact of the matter is that international law will change, actually, on the 29th of March next year. Uh, and, and, and our present circumstance, uh, the, the amount of fishing opportunity that we get, is extremely distorted in international terms. It's, it's just not normal. Now, the, the Prime Minister has promised that there will be fairer shares for UK fishing. Uh, and and uh, unless it's really badly handled, that's what will uh, come to pass. But it's really important that the UK takes its place and to not do so would be a national humiliation for a nation with our maritime history and our position in the middle of the best fishing grounds in the world. It would be a national humiliation if we didn't decide what is caught, where it's caught and by whom in our waters. Absolutely. What's caught, where it's caught and by whom in our waters. But he's incredibly naive saying that he expects that. And he went on to say in that interview that Norway and other countries in the EU reserve the rights, reserve the right even to take 85% of what is caught in its waters. And this is what he's expecting after we finally leave the European Union. But it's not going to happen. He's incredibly naive. After the sellout that we saw last week, which I described, he still thinks that Theresa May who favour staying in the European Union, will get a good deal for the UK's fishermen. They won't get a good deal. And we're seeing 
the vote to leave being attacked as never before today and yesterday and all this week from those who say that the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal is evidence that the referendum was tainted and the claims that vote leave overspent and broke spending regulations, it's under enormous attack this. It's quite extraordinary really. We'll leave that for the minute. We'll come back to Cambridge Analytica because it came up at Prime Minister's questions today. We'll have a look at that. Let's talk for a minute about the United States kicking out Russian diplomats. This was announced, of course, yesterday. Everybody's kicking out the Russians, God love them. The United States has said that Russia has to first confess to the Salisbury chemical attack in order to mend relations with the US and NATO. It's a wonderful ultimatum, that. Admit that you did something that you say you didn't do and that we don't have any evidence that you did. Admit it, and then we can move on from there. State Department spokeswoman Heather Nauert spoke to reporters last night in D.C. That's State Department spokeswoman Heather Nauert. Have a listen to what she had to say. This is quite comical. We have long said uh, that Russia remains uh, a country that is interested in fiddling with other people's elections. The United States, uh, that is not unique to the United States. We've seen that in Mexico. We've seen that in France. Uh, European countries that have elections coming up, we've seen Russian attempts at meddling and also with, the, um, with propaganda as well. So we can't say that the United States is going to be any safer from its re- election as a result. Russia has long arms. Russia has lots of tentacles. Uh, we imagine that they will uh, continue to have an interest in our elections, but also many other nations' elections as well. Arms okay. and tentacles. Arms and tentacles, uh, that's right. Quite a, quite a beast. It's, it's like a, it's, Can you just, I, I just want <laughs> It's a beast from the deep sea. I just want to um, make an appeal. Can you try, you just said in answer to her question, I don't know what these guys were up to. Can you ask? I'm saying just, I don't personally I know, know, I know exactly what they were up but to, can, but we can say can we they find, were spies. We're kicking them out. The nation will be safer. We we will be better off as a country with 60 less spies here in the United States. Can you just find out, ask if from this building we can get someone to give us even a general idea of whatever bad stuff these guys were doing? Not like, you know, it doesn't have to be completely specific, but just some Mm -hmm. idea. Because, frankly, just saying that dude's a spy, get out, I mean... Matt, these are things that are, are tracked closely by um, I, I'm sure they are, certain but, you know, departments and, and, and people here in people well. here in, in so. Washington. <laughs> WMD in Iraq was tracked as well, said the um, said the press said, said said the journalist at that briefing, channeling a bit of H.P. Lovecraft there, Heather Nauert. It, it's ridiculous. It seems the more ridiculous, the more outrageous the behaviour of spokesmen and women for foreign ministries around Europe and in America. The more silly and the more, you know, absolutely mad, really, the claims, the more they're taken seriously. But here's a bit of interesting information. RT spoke with a guy called Dr. Ralph Trapp. Politicos like me, well, we know all about Ralph Trapp. He's a former secretary of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. So what's Ralph Trapp saying? I don't have any audio, but he's given an an interview to Insurge and he told Insurge that while there is compelling evidence that Russia did run a secret research program to make chemical agents, there has been no proof that such programs still exist today. This is important. And I'll quote Dr. Ralph Trapp. Again, remember, he's a former scientific advisory board member for the organisation for the prohibition of chemical weapons. And he says, I've no information about whether Russia continued the programme after the mid-90s, but I wouldn't exclude the possibility that small amounts of what could be explained away as materials needed in protective research have been retained or newly synthesised. But again, no actual data on this. Now, responding to the question, was Russia behind the attack on the Skripal's Trapp said, well, there are other theoretical possibilities. It would depend on what else the UK knows and has not yet made public. And he went on to say, he can't immediately see motive or opportunity for other parties to be involved except for the UK, as suggested by Russia. But he said he didn't uh, consider that theory credible at all. 
But he made the point, and it's very important to reiterate that he made the point, that no credible evidence has been presented yet to suggest that Russia was behind the attack. Now, Sergei Skripal's next-door neighbour has been speaking to Sky News here in the UK. His name is Ross Cassidy, and he claims to be Sergei Skripal's best friend. And he has said that the Russian spy and his daughter should be allowed to die, strangely. Cassidy is a haulage contractor, and he said he hadn't been able to visit Skripal or his daughter... And he has no contact with the doctors treating Skripal, but that he believes they are so critically ill it would be best to let them die. Very strange this. This is Ross Cassidy, Skripal's next door neighbour, whom we never heard about till yesterday, speaking with Sky News. I was aware of his, um, his background. I can't say I approve of treachery, quite frankly, but, uh, you know, that was none of my business. He was friendly and he was generous. He, he never forgot my birthdays, for instance. He always used to ring me up on my birthdays. Sergei lived next door with daughter Yulia and his late wife and son, then moved, but he and Ross kept in touch. He spent a lot of time out of the country. Um, and, of course, you know, there, there were weeks that I... I didn't see him. He used to call me his English friend, and I'm sure that's the way it was. And still is. I mean, it's... Well, well yeah, we're talking in the past tense. But, uh, that, that's, it's interesting, uh, isn't yeah. it, that because yeah. he and Yulia are so very ill, there's yeah. a tendency for people to almost dismiss them. Well, yeah, but that's understandable. I mean, uh, quite frankly, um, what future have they got? We've already been told that they'll be severely mentally impaired, and... Uh, I don't think they'd want that, and quite frankly, I think death would probably be merciful. Who is this guy to say that death would be merciful when he hasn't been allowed to see them? There's no evidence he's tried to get in to see them. He's not a doctor, he hasn't spoken to any doctors. Very strange that, isn't it, that we didn't know anything about this guy until very recently. As the newspapers are calling the guy Skripal's next door neighbour, which is which is an untruth. It's a brilliant bit of um, sleight of hand because he used to live next door to him some time ago but hasn't lived next door to him for several years and this guy claims that Skripal kept in touch with him and referred to him as his English mate. But the only reason Sky had him on today was to say that he thinks they should be allowed to die because they are so critically ill. I found that strange. Don't you find that a little bit strange? What, what, but, but what can you do? What can you do? Because what can you know? Because these people won't talk to the likes of us where they'll be questioned on these issues. 21 minutes past the hour. This is Wednesday's Richie Allen Show. We're going to change tack slightly. We will talk about Cambridge Analytica a little bit later this hour. But when we come back, I want to talk about ADHD and specifically adult ADHD. There were some bizarre news reports this morning about adult ADHD that I want you to hear. We'll talk about that when we come back on Wednesday's Richie Allen Show. Back in 90 seconds. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. 
Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the program. Right, loads of um, interest in the phone-in show, or the phone-in segment of the show. The meme is on facebook.com forward slash the Richie Allen Show. All the details are there. The phone number is, if you're calling in the UK, 0161. 818 That's 2018. Now, you can Skype chat with Richie. All the details are on a meme. Don't do this or call me ahead of me opening the line because I won't answer because I have plenty of things to get through between now and then. So you're only wasting your time if you're trying to get through to me now. Don't um, do that. Wait till the second hour of the program. This is very interesting. You might know Richard Bacon as a former Blue Peter presenter. He also presented a drive time program for Radio 5 Live for some years as well. Now in the last couple of days he gave an interview to the Sun newspaper where Bacon said that he has been diagnosed with ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It's often called ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. Now he's 42 is Bacon, so he's pretty much the same age as me. I'm 43. And he's working in the US now, not for Fox News, but for the Fox Company. And he went to doctors in the US because he said his behaviour was causing his life to enter something of a tailspin. He said the consequences of his behaviour built up into something serious for him and his family. He said a combination of trivial matters and a hard partying lifestyle made him feel like he was losing control. Bacon said to the son, I'd lose credit cards twice a week and my wallet, keys, passport and phone. It sounds trivial, but the consequences add up to something quite serious for your family. On top of all that, he said, I was going out too late and I was drinking too much. He said, this caused pain and chaos. It's been a relief to be diagnosed with ADHD, he said. I'm better, I'm sleeping better and only drinking a couple of times a week. And um, he spoke to Radio 5 Live today, did Bacon. And I've got an interesting 45 second clip of that and then we'll talk about it and we'll also hear from a psychologist. This is really important stuff, this. This is really important. So listen to what Bacon said. Bacon is an innocent enough guy, journalist, presenter, making a life for himself now in America, former BBC. He's 42 and he has been diagnosed with adult ADHD. Right. I thought, yes, I do. Yes, okay, we can hear Bacon. Richard Bacon then. My son said to said to Rebecca, my wife, the other day, you know, when we were explaining this process that I was going through, and he said, you know, when, when dad gets his brain fixed, will he be able to do Lego with me? And it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's focusing on them, being present in the moment, um, uh, the, the hyper focus to me basically translates as being in love with stuff in the news a lot of the time. And it's that not reaching for Twitter to check a headline about Donald Trump whilst I'm trying to build um, the, uh, you know, the Millennium Falcon out of Lego with my son. It, it's, it's just being more present with them, I think. Being more present with them. So trying to build the Millennium Falcon with his son and then he would be compelled to check Twitter. Keep that in mind now for a few minutes. That was Richard Bacon. I'm going to repeat myself once or twice during this segment, but I have to do it. Bacon is 42 and has accepted 
a, a diagnosis of ADHD, ad, adult ADHD. Now, Susan Young is the president of the ADHD Association. She was interviewed by Radio 5 Live's Rachel Borden. Borden told Susan Young that Richard Bacon had a brain scan as part of his diagnosis, which is very strange. Young didn't get into that, but Borden asked Young, how easy is it to diagnose somebody or anybody with ADHD? Um, ADHD is assessed by, uh, you know, a group of symptoms, that, a constellation of symptoms that hang together and they, that cause people impairment in their lives. And there's a very clear, uh, d- uh, d- uh, there are very clear um, uh, diagnostic criteria um, that are used in uh, America and the UK and, and, and Europe and, and across the world to diagnose ADHD. Right. There you go. She's given the very clear definition of ADHD. Well, of course she didn't. She said it's a group of symptoms. Then she said it's a constellation of symptoms that hang together. It's very clear, she said. And to reiterate that, there is consensus on this. She said it's in the US and in the UK. It's clear what it is. It's very, 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 very clear. In fact, she was very, 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 very vague in her definition of it. So what did our fearless BBC presenter say next? Mm. And we know um, that it is or our rates of diagnosis amongst children is probably better, but this is a condition that you live with lifelong. It's something you don't particularly grow out of. Would that be right? Hmm, said Rachel Burden. Hmm, we know this and we know that. She didn't say that the renowned Harvard neurologist Jerome Kagan says it's bollocks. She doesn't mention Texas doctor Bruce Perry or Richard Saul, a 50-year experienced physician who wrote a book called ADHD Does Not Exist. Perry, as in Bruce Perry in Texas, he said that ADHD was merely a description of symptoms that most people will show signs of at one time or another. But no, of course, BBC presenters don't ask good questions. Then Rachel Burden gets to the real reason we're hearing from the lady psychologist. This is not an interview at all. It's an advertising feature, an advertising feature for Big Pharma. Sure, there must be loads of people with ADHD and they don't even realise it. But there will be people perhaps who have undiagnosed ADHD. Well, we know that there will be. Of course there will be. And interestingly, some um, listeners already were in touch this morning hearing Richard speak and say, "That, that sounds exactly like me. That begins to make sense with a lot of the kind of stuff I'm dealing with in my life. Exactly. There, there are actually loads of people, um, I think, with, uh, with undiagnosed ADHD. Um, I've done a lot of work, for example, in the prisons, and there around uh, we found we did, we've done comprehensive clinical assessments in prisons, and around um, 25% of people in our adult prisons have ADHD and around 30% in youth offending institutions. And what is staggering is that we as the researchers are the people who are identifying this disorder there but very few of them have had the disorder identified in childhood or have received treatment for it um, and also but if you another study that was done that i was involved in where we went into lots of different adult mental health settings addiction services anxiety services and there's a lot of undiagnosed adhd yeah. What that means is that people are being mis- not only misdiagnosed, but many individuals are being, um, uh, are being uh, uh, sorry, not only are people being missed, the diagnosis is being missed in many individuals, but mm. they're being misdiagnosed. Do you hear what she said there? She said it's staggering that researchers like her are finding people with ADHD. It's staggering that they're qualified. Now, look, let's not play games here. Let's just talk as the system talks for a minute. People that the system deems to be qualified, as in doctors, are not finding it. We're staggered, the researchers, that we're meeting all these people with ADHD and doctors are not finding it. And we're finding it in prisons, she said. In prisons. And they're being misdiagnosed. ADHD is everywhere in our prisons, she said. Wouldn't Big Pharma love to get into prisons? Send in the doctors, diagnose 
and make billions, eh? So uh, given the high rate that you're finding in prison populations, is it an inhibiting factor then when it comes to your kind of cognitive ability and a decision, um, an ability to make sort of appropriate decisions? Um, yes, I think it is. And, and I certainly don't want to give the impression that everybody with ADHD will, will end up in prison because that's not the case at all. Too late, love. You've already done that. Oh. And she goes on to do it again right now. Have a listen. I'm just saying there are high rates of undiagnosed um, ADHD in those settings. But, um, but I think, yes, people with ADHD, they have difficulty paying attention. They have difficulty organising themselves. They, um, and, and these kind of things in, uh, in impact on their ability to uh, make good, de- to, good decision, to, have it, to have good decision-making skills and to have good problem-solving st- skills. Uh, it, it's no, it, because they... they They don't think through the consequences of behaviour. What happens when you talk a load of monumental bollocks is you start stuttering and stammering like that. You find it difficult to formulate your ideas in a coherent sentence. So she's talking through her arse, but this is very dangerous, you see, because she's making some incredibly wild claims there. And she's not a doctor nor a scientist. She's a researcher a researcher. She calls herself a psychologist, which is not a science. A researcher. And she said that undiagnosed ADHD may be the reason why some people don't understand the consequences of their behaviour and then offend. And There's no challenge coming from anybody. The BBC could have found one of Dozens and dozens and dozens of not conspiracy theorists or holistic practitioners, but actual academics like the ones I mentioned, to say this is bollocks. This is an advertising feature for, this is the beginning of an idea. We're seeing the genesis now of an idea to get millions and millions and millions of people onto ADHD medication. This is how it begins, you see. National radio stations providing a platform for quacks, cranks and shills like Susan Young to go on the air and to start telling wild stories about how there are vast numbers of people in society with ADHD that need to be diagnosed. Prisons are full of people who might not be there if they had been diagnosed. Think of the implications of that. And if it couldn't get any worse, or you thought it couldn't get any worse, then you get this from the BBC. Should you go to your GP, will they always have a a full understanding of the kind of spectrum of symptoms for ADHD? Uh, yes, you should go to your GP. They are the gatekeepers for uh, being referred to the appropriate services for comprehensive assessments. Um, unfortunately, I think that you know GPs have what five minutes with you, um, so they uh, you know there are many GPs who are not really up to speed with ADHD, and they're very pressured and overworked, and it's very difficult. But others will recognise the symptoms and will refer. So I think um, it's a little bit of a lottery as to as to uh, how well your GP is. Mm. It's one of the groups that we would like to target for training um, and to sort of to reach out to GPs to support and help them. It's one of the groups we'd like to target for training. Yes, we want to target GPs to pressure them into diagnosing people with ADHD. So you get to your doctor and you tell your doctor you know, I'm here because I can't concentrate and I can't focus and you'll get medicated. So, take me for example. Take you for example. Take somebody living next door to you for example. Because we don't know the sort of lifestyles people are are leading. But somebody is not sleeping well. The person is worried about their bills maybe their relationship is suffering as a result of this and because they are tired all the time. They forget things, they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they're a bit irritable and they go to a GP. Now a GP, as the guest acknowledged there, only has a few minutes 
to spend with each pa- with each patient. This is due to the targeting systems imposed on GPs, NHS surgeries around the country by the Labour government. They've only got a few minutes. That's all they have. They will input what you tell them to their computer. Tired. Can't focus. Can't concentrate. Can't keep, keep my mind on one thing for too long without getting distracted. And I'm irritable. They'll put this into their computer, which is just a big pharma manual, basically, and that will diagnose appropriately. The computer will diagnose it and the computer will recommend a prescription accordingly. This isn't bullshit. This is what happens. It's been over two years since I was in a surgery, but it's what happened. It's what the doctor did when I was speaking to her. She typed stuff into a computer. You might as well phone phone a call centre. You might as well phone a call centre. See, that's what doctors do now. And I've been thinking about it, thinking, why even go to the GP? Why not phone a call centre? And in fact, it's gotten so bad now that mobile phones or smartphones have apps with doctors where you don't need to leave the house. You can pay X amount of money and see a doctor through the camera on your smartphone. So why not go to a call centre? Why not phone a call centre? Hello, this is the doctors. Yes, I'm tired all the time. I feel like a zombie. I'm forgetting things and I'm irritable and I can't concentrate. Thank you, sir. Please hold one minute. One minute, sir. Right? Then she comes back and says, you have ADHD. We'll send a prescription to you. And you don't have to pick it up, sir. Don't worry about picking it up. I'm sending you some Ritalin through Amazon.co.uk. If you listen closely, you'll be able to hear the drone now dropping your medicine down the chimney. That's where it's going. It's madness. I have or had a family doctor. It's a very, very old, very, very senior lady. These were doctors. These are real doctors. We all remember them. The old family doctors. Now you've got kids just out of university they're not doctors. They are big pharma representatives who crammed like a bastard at university to get their degree, go straight into the workplace. And I think they're dangerous. Not all of them, and they're not deliberately dangerous, but they represent, I think, a clear and present danger to the to the lives and the health of their patients. Because all they're doing is what I did there. Click, 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 click. All right, you've got this. Here's the prescription. Um, Go and take it and we'll give you a call in a week and see how it's going. It's not just worrying the madness of, you know, the madness of of life, (coughs) excuse me, that's causing sleeplessness and lack of concentration and lack of focus. No, it isn't. It's it's EMF, Wi-Fi, smart meters, 5G, the food that we're eating. All of these things conspiring to make it so that you can't concentrate. I can't concentrate. I find it very difficult when I'm not doing what I'm doing because I'm so tired to concentrate. And the future Mrs. Allen will regularly say to me, did you not hear what I just said? Or I will hear something on television, on a news programme, and a couple of minutes later I won't remember what was said and I'll ask, what, what was said there? I don't have ADHD. That's a big pharma invention so that children could be medicated all over the world. What I have is uh, a natural response to the crazy environment that I live in. Richard Bacon is probably a decent bloke. Did anybody think to say to Richard Bacon, so you're making the Millennium Falcon with your son and you get irritable and you check your mobile phone to see what's on Twitter. Do you ever think that's not... A psychological condition, Richard, that needs to be treated with medication. Did you ever think that's down to the fact that the phone is there in the first place? It's there. It's an addiction, Richard, that you can deal with yourself by switching it off. Do you really need Ritalin to be able to spend quality time with your son, man, and to make that Millennium Falcon with Lego or whatever? Do you really need to take Ritalin to be able to do that? Why not turn off the phone the laptop, the tablet, leave it. Ignore it. 
This is craziness, this. And, and, the, and the real worry about this is, is that there's no challenge to it. None. You have BBC Radio 5 Live effectively acting as an advertising feature platform for Big Pharma to say, without any challenge, oh, we reckon there are massive, they're talking about millions of people that are going around that probably have ADHD. And this thing about prisons is incredibly sinister. We've been in prisons and we think loads of prisoners. So let's, let's do that. Let's effectively lobotomize people in prison by putting them on medication to make them all acquiescent and all quiet. Most people are in prison, A, because they stole to feed a drug habit or they stole to feed themselves. They're not there because they couldn't make good decisions um, because they needed to be diagnosed with ADHD and they needed Ritalin. No, they're there because society wants to lock people up. Because life is miserable. Life is fucking terrible. It's horrible for most people. Even those people who think they're doing well. We've got a couple of cars and a drive. We've got a four-bedroomed house. We go away two or three times a year. Yes, mate, but you never see your wife. She never sees you. Because both of you are working 60 hours a week. The children are a distant memory. And that lovely house, it won't be paid for for 35 years. How's that life? That's enough to drive anybody mad. And they want to diagnose that now. Adult ADHD, the next thing, the coming thing, coming soon to a surgery near you, just like statins came in. This is where it's going. 